we've all had our fair share of wrong numbers. More often than not, they're pretty harmless. You tell the other person they made a mistake, and then you go about your day. But sometimes, you get a phone call that sticks with you the rest of your life. The kind of call you can't explain. You know, the ones you can only describe as phone call creepypastas or perhaps even cell phone creepypastas. But the good news is, you're not alone. There are tons of people who get creepy phone calls. For real. And chances are, their calls have been just as bad, if not worse, than yours. Creepy phone calls that have kept people up at night for weeks, months, even years. Were they real people? Ghosts? Versions of people from a parallel dimension? I'll let you decide. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. I have a few things planned for this hour, but I'm not exactly sure how much time I'll have for everything, so I'll just tell you that we're going to start with some creepy phone calls. Reddit users share some of the strangest, most terrifying phone calls they've ever received, many that left the recipient with no explanation as to what just happened. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. While you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. A few years ago, my brother would get a call on his cell phone around 2 or 3 in the morning. Every morning. He'd answer, and it was this hellish-sounding noise, like static mixed with screams. He changed his cell number after a month of this, and it stopped. Then, after a week or so, it began again. The exact same noise. Exact same time. Finally, one day, he decided to backdial the call. It was an old man that had no clue what he was talking about. Still, the calls persisted. If he didn't answer, it would call a few more times. No messages were ever left. He decided to just say screw it, ended his contract with his phone company, switched to a new company, and then got a whole new number. You guessed it, the screaming static calls continued after a short delay. By this time, he was terrified every night, unsure why this was happening. He backdialed the number again and got a different person. Around this time, he lost his job and his phone. The calls stopped, of course. His phone was disconnected now. So one day, my mom asks me to listen to this weird message she got on our home phone. It was the static screaming. We showed my brother and he was freaking out. He backdialed the number again, and it said the number was disconnected this time. Never heard from it again after that. When my sister was young, my parents got her a personal phone, a landline so that she could feel special. Yes, she was extra spoiled. It was a prepaid landline, though, so basically no one could call in or out if she ran out of credit much like a mobile phone. Anyway, every night at 3 a.m., her phone would ring. She said that there was a man on the other line and she'd get really scared and come running to my room. It escalated to the point that I asked her to please disconnect her phone before going to sleep because it was becoming extremely annoying to get woken up every single night by this person that called her. Eventually, she got rid of the phone. A few years ago, we were talking about it, and she confessed that her phone continued to ring even after she disconnected it, 
which is why she said she didn't want it anymore. She has no recollection of what the person on the other end was saying. Or maybe she's just completely blocked it out. About a couple of weeks after I was born, my dad's best friend, Jim, died. They were really close, and one of the last things he wanted was to hold little me before he passed. His wish was filled, and some short time after that, he was gone. Fast forward seven years. I'm now a happy seven-year-old with a five-year-old brother and recently born sister. One day the phone rings and with my mom out and dad in the washroom, I thought it was going to be ignored as we kids were still too young to answer the phone. No call display at that time. We didn't even know that there would be a stranger on the other end. But my brother broke the rules and he answered the phone. Hello? At this point, my dad is out of the washroom and he's asking my brother to hand him the phone. He ignores him and keeps listening to whoever is speaking. Before my dad could ask a second time, my brother hangs up, looks at him and says, Jim says hi and he misses Skywing Nova, and then goes back to playing. The look of shock my dad had is what I remember most about this. Before my family and I moved to another state, my father visited the area to check on the progress of our new house which was being built. My father was there for a few days and was staying at some crappy Motel 6 in a shady area of town. His room was the last room at the end of the hallway on the top floor. In the middle of the night, on the last night he was in town, he was woken by the phone ringing in his room. He groggily answered, It was the front desk, and they say something along the lines of, Sorry to wake you, but we've been receiving a couple of reports about rooms being broken into and some stuff being stolen. We are calling to make sure you lock your door and are safe. My father replies that he's fine and hangs up. He decides to double check that he locked the door, though. As he sits up in bed, he notices that the door to his room is ajar. Being spooked, he cautiously checks the room out and finds that nothing is missing and no one else is in the room. He creeps to the door and peeks out. Sitting right outside his room, on the windowsill of the hallway window, is his shaving kit. Creeped out of his mind, he quickly grabs it and locks the door. After he calms down a bit, he calls down to the front desk and says, Hey, you just called me about the break-ins around the hotel? I just want to report that my room was broken into when I was sleeping. Nothing stolen, and I'm fine. Figured you'd like to know. The front desk replied, You must be mistaken, sir. We never called your room, and we haven't received any reports of break-ins. More creepy true phone calls when Weird Darkness returns. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. If you or someone you know struggles with depression or dark thoughts, I'd like to recommend the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous free resources to help you fight depression, including the Crisis Text Line, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, Save.org, and iFred, and more. These resources are absolutely free, and they are there when you need them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. We now continue with more creepy, true, often terrifying phone calls on Weird Darkness. When I was a child, we would frequently get calls for a woman named Tanya. Didn't seem like a big deal. She had the same last name as us, although it is quite a common name around here. When we moved across the city and phone books stopped being the go-to for finding somebody's number, the calls for Tanya gradually stopped. Those days seemed to have ended, and we carried on forgetting about the mysterious Tanya. It was about four years ago that she popped up in our lives again. I was driving home from work one afternoon and was greeted by a pretty grisly car wreck at the turn to my house. 
two cars had collided. One had wrapped itself around a signage pole that had house numbers and directions on it, one of which was my house number. Several days later, we get a call from the police. They asked if Tanya was at this residence. Her car was found, wrapped around a pole, down the street from my house, and she was nowhere to be found at the accident site. Haven't heard anything about her since. When I was younger, my family was extremely poor and lived in a very old mobile home on some land my grandpa owned. This piece of land was in a very small town out in the middle of nowhere Texas and covered in woods. The town itself was your typical small country town where football was king and there was nothing to do but get drunk or high on the weekend. It was also the type of town, along with it being early 90s, where one didn't typically have to worry too much about locking their doors or setting an alarm. Now, our trailer was a two-bedroom and my parents, always putting us kids ahead of themselves, slept in the living room on a fold-out couch. My room was directly connected to it, and my sister's room was down a hallway past the kitchen and bathroom at the other end of the trailer. One night, after everybody had gone to bed, my dad was woken up by a feeling that there was someone in the room. He looked around a bit and sees a large male figure sitting in the easy chair just feet from the bed. My dad quickly flipped on the light switch next to his bed and saw it was a neighbor from down the road named Carter. Carter was known to be a frequent drug user and was often in trouble with the law because of this. My dad asked him what he was doing here and told him to get out, and he responded, I can't get out. The demons are chasing me and your house is the only safe one. My dad, who I should mention is fairly large and terrifying, responded that if he didn't get out and get out quickly that the house would be a lot less safe for him. If I leave, they'll get me, he said. They've been chasing me all night. If they catch me, I'm dead. My dad's response was there were no demons, but that if he didn't get out of his house, he'd be dead. From what I've been told, since I was asleep for this part, my mom also hurled a few threats, and while she may not be big, she was equally as terrifying. I believe it was her anger that finally scared him off. My dad got up and locked the door and watched through the blinds as Carter decided, since he couldn't outrun the demons, he'd steal our old beater Suburban that my dad always left the keys in. He drove around for about an hour. We called the police, and it took them about that long to get out to us, since the closest police station was about 20 or 30 minutes away. He finally brought it back and was arrested and taken to jail. He was deemed crazy and ended up locked in a mental institution. The scariest part is that, for years after this, we'd get phone calls where all we'd hear is music that would have lyrics like, I'm going to effing kill you. These calls lasted for years and followed us from house to house, even though we always had different phone numbers and would even be in different states. We always thought it was him sending us a message. The calls stopped when I was about 12 years old. I later found out that it was around that time that Carter thought the best thing he could do for himself was soak himself in gasoline and set himself on fire. My grandmother died of brain cancer about 20 years ago. About two weeks after she died, I was hanging out at my parents' place and my mom got a call. No number, no unknown number, just blank caller ID. She answered it, got quiet, hung up and went to her room without saying anything. When I finally got her to talk about it, she said that it was her mother, saying she was trapped and please come get her because they wouldn't let her leave, over and over again and then the phone disconnected. I asked her about it a few years ago, and she denied that it happened for a bit, and then admitted that it had happened two more times that year, and then stopped. But she didn't want to discuss it anymore. It was my first time staying home alone while my whole family was out at my brother's ball game. I was 13, I think. I'm on the phone with a friend of mine, feeling so grown up when someone beeps in on the other line. I tell her I'll be right back and click over lines. Then the creepiest voice I've ever heard says, Hello, little girl. I'm the man in your basement. Now, honestly, I laughed it off and just hung up, thinking it was a prank call. 
It was a pretty confident little thing, and my neighborhood was pretty safe, so I figured somebody was just messing with me, knowing it was my first time alone. They beeped in again, so I clicked over and heard, "'Don't you effing hang up on me, you little bitch!' and the lights started flickering and there was banging under my feet. I know it sounds crazy, but my dog started freaking out and my cat ran away, so I assure you I wasn't imagining a thing. Our basement was actually just an area connected to the garage. It wasn't finished. I heard what sounded like footsteps coming up the garage steps to get into our kitchen, and I threw stuff in front of the door and heard yelling and whatnot. I kept trying to hang up and call the cops, but every time I tried to, he was still on the phone. My friend told her parents what was happening, and they ran to the neighbor's house to call the police for me. I sat petrified with a broken rifle, a butcher knife, and a baseball bat behind my front door because it's the only place in the house downstairs that couldn't be seen from a window. Crying. Eventually, I clicked over to hear a police dispatcher on the phone and stayed on the line with her until the police got to my house. There was no sign of forced entry though we had a broken window pane on our outside garage door that had been messed up for months prior, and my guess is he used that to get in. The police assumed I was just a paranoid girl, and they were going to leave me home alone after they gave an all-clear. Fortunately, a family friend had been driving by and saw the cops there and stopped to see if everything was okay. He gave me a ride to the school where my family was. They were skeptical that anything had happened, but we did get a security system not too much longer after that, and my parents both got cell phones too. This was 1994. I think cell phones weren't super popular yet. After this happened, I swear there was someone stalking me for years. I would leave my apartment locked and bolted and come back to find appliances on, hair dryer, stove, heat on in the middle of the summer. I lived in four different places and would get strange phone calls at every one despite my being unlisted. Cars would randomly be parked down the road from the house and speed up and slam on the brakes as I would run inside. I'd hear loud bangs outside when I lived out in the country. Nothing has happened since I've been in my current house and married, but I am still super paranoid all the time. Around the time I was 19, I was deployed to Iraq. My unit worked with bombs, and honestly, I didn't know if I'd make it home intact. About halfway through my tour, the Red Cross notified my unit that my father was terminally ill. Within a week, I was on a plane back to the States. Now, my dad being ill was something I'd grown used to. He was strong, though, and I never expected to actually lose him. I lost my mother when I was seven and my father's lungs had collapsed shortly before then. He was on oxygen and needed a wheelchair to go anywhere. Medication by the handfuls were needed every few hours. He gained weight from limited movement, developed diabetes, and had already beaten cancer once. I never expected to lose him, and he wasn't the type to ever just give up. I arrive home, head to the hospital, and he assures me he's fine and they're overreacting. I visit him every day I'm there, but he tells me he'll be fine by the time I get home for good. I reluctantly go back overseas. I call his hospital whenever I have a few minutes of free time and we're near a call center. My deployment finishes and he kept his promise. He comes home from the hospital because he says he doesn't want to die there. He gets worse and goes back. The family all visits, but we know he isn't improving. One day I'm at home and the phone rings. It's an unknown number, so I don't answer it. It goes to the answering machine and a very raspy voice mumbles, call the hospital. It's my dad's voice. I grab the phone, but he already hung up. So I call. They tell me he has been intubated for the past couple hours and he just started going into cardiac arrest. He's non-responsive and we need to come say our goodbyes. I argue that no, he just called me and she says that's not possible. They've been working on him for some time now, apparently. I hung up and told my family the news. My sister and I stared at the answering machine. We played the tape again and again. That was the last time I heard my father's voice. I'm a skeptic. I don't believe in the paranormal or ghosts, and I can't come up with any logical explanation. I still get watery-eyed thinking about it. More creepy true phone calls when Weird Darkness returns.
Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you like Weird Darkness and you'd like to hear even more, you can check out the free audiobooks I've narrated at WeirdDarkness.com. I've got free audiobooks there by Algernon Blackwood, Edgar Allan Poe, Stephen King, H.P. Lovecraft, Charles Dickens, Robert Heinlein, Robert Louis Stevenson, and more. You can listen to all of the free audiobooks I've narrated on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. We continue with the strange, creepy, and terrifying phone calls on Weird Darkness. This one night, when I arrived for work, my supervisor looked confused and asked me what I was doing there. I said, I work tonight, and he said, but they said you called in a few hours ago saying that you were sick. I was a bit confused and said, it must have been somebody else, and they got the message wrong. After everyone else showed up for work that night, it was a bit more weird, but we carried on as usual and assigned everyone their places for the night. I went to work in the control room where I usually am. The control room is the center of the prison that has direct control over the cameras, doors, phones, and everything. After I relieved the guard on duty and settled in for the night, I looked at the message that said I called in. It said I had called at 6.50 and said that I had gotten sick while out cleaning up after the storm. There had been a storm the night before, and it was pretty bad but not anything that I had to go out and clean up. It was truly weird. The supervisor came into the control about that time. He was also a friend of mine outside work, and we started talking about it and how odd it was. I decided to call my wife at home and tell her about it while he was still sitting there. I picked up the phone and dialed. After two rings, a man picked up the phone and with a raspy voice said, Hello? I didn't know what to say for a few seconds. I looked at the phone to make sure I dialed the right number, and I had. After a few seconds, the person said hello again in that same raspy voice. I said, hello, who is this? This is Taylor, who is this? The person said. My head started spinning because my name is Taylor as well. I said in almost a scream, where is Ann? He said, Ann's in bed, who is this? I dropped the phone and told my supervisor to ring me out. I had to get home, and I took off towards the door. I could hear Dave pick up the phone behind me and say, hello, followed soon after by, what the F, rather loudly. I ran to my car and drove home faster than what was legal, my mind racing the entire time. I busted through the door and my wife was sitting watching TV and was shocked at me being home. I asked her who was there and she said, no one has been there. After a rather long talk with my wife, I went to call the prison to tell them what was going on, but the phone was dead. I went back to work, and when I came in, Dave was acting weird and asked me, how the hell are you doing this? He told me that when I left, he picked up the phone and the person on the other end sounded like me. He kind of freaked out and hung up the phone. A minute later, as he could see my car leaving the parking lot, I would called back from home and asked, what was going on. He said that I was a bit irate and said I was sick and did not feel like playing these games and was telling him to stop prank calling me and hung up. After convincing him I had no idea what was going on, we went back to work. Later I find out that the phone line for my area had been knocked down the night before by the storm. The phones weren't working at all. This is absolutely the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. not my story, but my boyfriend, who for the sake of the story we will call Bob, shared this one with me. When he was about 8 to 10 years old, he's not really sure of the age, he would receive calls on the house phone from some mysterious guy. The guy would call when Bob was the only one home, before his brother, who was three years older than him, would come back from school and while his parents were working. This guy would curse Bob out and tell him to shut up and do whatever I say. The guy told Bob that he knew where he lived, he knew where Bob's parents worked, and he knew that Bob was alone. The guy told Bob that if he told anyone that he was calling Bob's home, he would kill his parents or him. Guess whatever was more terrifying that day. 
Being a young, scared kid at the time, Bob complied and would do things like take off his clothes while on the phone or dance around in the living room. Bob didn't tell me the full extent of the stranger's demands, but part of me really doesn't want to know. So Bob entertained this guy for some time. Again, he didn't specify how long, until one day Bob's brother comes home and sees Bob on the phone doing this. Bob's brother asks who it is, and after getting off the phone, an apprehensive Bob finally explains to his older brother the details about this mysterious caller. When Bob's older brother found out, the next day he came home early for the call and, with a few friends on speakerphone, told the guy to F off and that they would find him with their posse and make his life a living hell. Bob lived in a predominantly Italian neighborhood where the mob life was very real. After they confronted the guy on the phone, the calls stopped and they were never harassed again. I was 16 and working at an ice cream store, all alone, late at night. It was the beginning of March in Canada, so the ground was covered in a thick layer of snow. I got a phone call. I can see you, a man's voice said eerily. I looked around in a panic. The store had huge glass windows on all sides. I couldn't see anybody in the darkness. I cringed in shock the man began to vividly describe how he planned to rape me. I was terrified, and as soon as the shock wore off, which seemed like ages because I heard part of his sickening description, I hung up the phone. It was disgusting. I was hysterical. I rushed to all the doors and locked them. Then I hid behind a counter with the phone. I was crying. I immediately called my boss and told him what had happened. I asked him if I should call the police. I know, dumb move, I should have just called them. I was shocked by his answer, though. He said it was a prank, open the store. That man was probably joking, go back to work. What a jerk. He wasn't even making money. It was after midnight, nobody was coming into the store, but he wanted me to endanger myself by opening up when some creep had been threatening me? I called my dad, who was furious. He came within five minutes. I closed the store and he took me home. Needless to say, I never went back to work there again and never spoke to my old boss again. Most terrifying thing ever. Way back in fifth grade or so, I discovered a glorious Pokemon-themed chat room through the wonders of Yahoo. Within this chat room, there were maybe 15 regulars, generally between the ages of 12 and 16 or so, and we had a great time role-playing various anime characters and storylines. Anyway, I got to know a few people from there well enough to chat with them on instant messenger or by phone, and a few of those friendships lasted a good four or five years. One of these guys was a little eccentric. He loved creature monster models and stories, stuff like Godzilla, Spawn, whatever. He believed in things like chupacabras, which I thought was silly but didn't really care, and he lived out in the boonies in some Midwestern state, which all seemed like hickland to my young West Coast mind. After getting to know him pretty well and having a good 100 hours of phone conversations over the years, he finally revealed this lovely story. He told me that sometimes he would black out and wake up to discover that he had or was still in the process of hurting or torturing animals and children. He had quite a few cousins and neighbor kids who lived nearby, and apparently he'd killed some animals. When he revealed this to me, I felt sick inside. I love animals, and this information chilled me to the bone. It was really hard for him to tell me this, and he confided that I was one of the only people he had ever been able to tell. Then it got weirder. Someone in his family, or maybe a family friend, decided that he must be possessed by a demon and that they had to perform an exorcism. They did it at night, of course, in a dark room lit by candles, and he was tied to the bed because they didn't know how the demon would react. He was choking up as he described this part. I could hear his voice quivering because he was so emotional and terrified at this part of the story. He described a pretty creepy process, but the worst part was the end. He said they heard something hit the floor under the bed when the demon left his body, 
and then something scrambled across the floor and out of the room in the darkness, leaving claw marks in the wood floor. He was totally and completely serious about this and how it cured him and he didn't hurt things anymore. I, as any sane person would do, noped right the heck out of that situation. My brother once got a phone call from a man asking how much are the girls going to cost. Thinking it was a prank joke, he said 50 pounds an hour. But then the man followed up with another question. They're all under 14 then? My brother immediately hung up the phone. He reported it to the police who said the number was unregistered. Twelve years ago, my brother died, and for that whole first year, a lot of super weird stuff happened to our family. The only conclusion I came to, and I do really believe this, was that he was trying to contact us. A week after his funeral, my mom was home by herself and the phone rang. This was about 2 p.m. The caller ID said that it was my brother's house, so she figured it was my sister-in-law. Mom answered, and when she said hello, there was no sound on the other end. No one answered. She said hello again, and still no answer. Then the call disconnected. She waited till about 6 p.m. when my sister-in-law came home from work, and she called her to ask if she'd come home from work and called her earlier. My sister-in-law said no. She asked if the kids had come home early. My sister-in-law asked my niece and nephew if they had come home to call Gran in the middle of the day, and neither of them had. They were in school the whole time till the end of the day. The phone was mounted to the kitchen wall, and the receiver was on the hook, so it's not like the dog knocked it over and accidentally stepped on a speed dial. We think it was my brother making contact to let my mom know he was around. I was with my girlfriend Alex, and we were making out when the phone rang. I answered it. What are you doing with my daughter? I asked Alex why her father would call me at this hour. What are you talking about? My dad's dead. She gave out a laugh. Once, when I was a teenager, I was waiting at an abandoned gas station in downtown Akron to meet a dealer to buy some weed. This was in about 1993 or 94, so payphones were still functional and in pretty common use. As I was waiting, the payphone in the parking lot started ringing. Bear in mind it was at about sunset on the outskirts of downtown and not another single person was around. Out of curiosity, I picked it up. The man on the other line asked, is this Chad? My name's not Chad, so I said no. The man ignored me and said, Chad, I want you to do bad things to me. I stated again that I wasn't Chad and asked him what he wanted, if he knew where he was calling, etc. He ignored me again and went into very explicit and specific detail about all the things he wanted Chad to do to him sexually. I was laughing and told him again that I wasn't Chad. Finally, he said he knew for sure I was Chad and described to me what Chad looks like. He described me, perfectly, down to the color of my shirt and what type of shoes I was wearing. I immediately hung up and looked around. There was nobody I could see, I mean not a single person around. I got into my car and got out of there. The Blood Countess, a fierce and chilling name given to Elizabeth Bathory, a noblewoman who lived in 16th century Slovakia, claimed to have tortured and murdered hundreds of young, beautiful girls. Why? Because she had cruel, sadistic tendencies. Plus, drinking and bathing in the blood of virgins maintained her beauty and youth. 
Stories circulated about the Blood Countess may sound like a sensationalized Hollywood horror script, yet these stories do have some historical context. So what is the real story behind the infamous Blood Countess? Has her supposed cruelty left behind any paranormal stains on the places she committed her heinous crimes? Elizabeth was born into a prominent Hungarian family in 1560. Her birth into nobility gained her a high social status, excellent education, wealth, and power. Elizabeth was engaged at a young age, likely for political reasons, and was married at the age of 15. She wed Count Ferenc Nadasti, another noble-born wealthy Hungarian. Interestingly, since Elizabeth was higher born than her husband, she retained her famed last name, Bathory. After the wedding, the new couple received Castus Castle as a gift. Soon Elizabeth moved in and engaged in routine torture of her servants. Supposedly Elizabeth's new husband supported her habit. To the extent he even had torture chambers fitted to her specifications in tunnels and rooms running directly below the castle. It wasn't until after her husband's death in 1604 that the rumors of Elizabeth's torture and murderous behavior truly escalated. Castus Castle saw an influx of young peasant girls, lured there with the promise of well-paid work. These young girls wouldn't survive long after meeting with the Blood Countess, though. The torture methods and death details of these girls were varied. They were burned with heated iron rods, pierced through the lips with needles, had fingernails removed and received beatings. More elaborate stories of the Blood Countess's depravity also exist. Some say she would bite hunks of flesh from the girls. Furthermore, some victims were left to freeze in harsh weather and others covered in honey to be feasted upon by insects. The bloodlust and vampire-like behavior of Elizabeth Bathory supposedly developed during these torture sessions. The blood from one of Elizabeth's victims once hit her hand during torture. She noticed her skin had been rejuvenated in the following days, with the skin in that area tightening. Following this, drinking and bathing in her victim's blood became common practice. The depraved nature of these crimes and their sheer scale meant it was just a matter of time before they were noticed. In 1610, Castus Castle was raided and the Blood Countess was caught red-handed in the act of murder. Elizabeth soon stood trial for her accused crimes. Hundreds testified against her, recounting tales of torture, murder, and providing estimated death tolls. Though widely debated, Elizabeth Bathory is rumored to have murdered anywhere between 36 and 650 individuals, securing her a place in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most prolific female serial killer ever documented. The Blood Countess trial saw Bathory's accomplices executed, yet Bathory herself spared. Her sentence was one of house arrest, likely chosen to prevent backlash for killing a noblewoman. Elizabeth spent the rest of her years bricked up inside a tower at Castus Castle. Fed and provided water through a small opening in the bricks, she was to die within the castle in 1614. The tales of the notorious Blood Countess are widespread and have been solidified in pop culture. However, her crimes are probably sensationalized. Stories specific to her vampire-like tendencies didn't appear for many years after her trial and death. There are some theories which suggest that envious men may have created the Blood Countess legends. Believed to be in attempts to overthrow such a powerful woman not common in that day and age. The political inclinations driving Bathory's arrest seem fitting with the social climate of that era. Elizabeth Bathory, having been captured red-handed, also remains an unsubstantiated tale. In reality, Elizabeth Bathory was likely not a murderous vampire. 
This hasn't halted superstitious tales of the paranormal forming around her legacy, though. There are many ghost stories that exist about the Blood Countess and her past dwellings, some of which have even become popular destinations for paranormal investigators. One property in the heart of Vienna is famed for housing ghosts of Elizabeth Bathory's past. The Countess herself supposedly lived within this property for quite some time. She had traveled to Vienna to be with her husband while he studied. It is here that the Blood Countess murder rampage supposedly started. The luring of young women to this property occurred from the local market. Death and torture did not occur in this house on quite the scale it did in contrast to Castus Castle, though many still believe stains of torment have become ingrained upon the house. It would make sense that Castus Castle's a place with a few ghost stories to tell. After all, it was the place that the majority of the Blood Countess's torture and murder was carried out. It was also Elizabeth's prison and place of death. Many people have claimed to experience paranormal activity within this stunning mountaintop ruin. There have been countless sightings of apparitions. These are sometimes formed of black mist or described as transparent humans. Some claim to have witnessed young ladies crying, believed to be torture victims. Many more have encountered a spirit, sometimes described as being faceless, thought to be Elizabeth Bathory. Whether there is any truth behind these gruesome tales, Elizabeth Bathory has certainly left behind quite a legacy. Her case is an interesting and mysterious one that we may never fully understand. Maybe Elizabeth's ghost would have something to say about the tales of the Blood Countess. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell somebody about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll not only get a copy of tonight's show, you'll also hear tonight's Sudden Death Overtime content, a lot of content I didn't have time to get to, plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can follow me on social media, drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I have already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 John 4, verse 9. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. And a final thought, people will always disappoint you. To remain happy, you must learn how to forgive, forget, and move on. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. One slave, terrified of punishment from Delphine, threw himself out of a third-story window, preferring death over torture. The third-story window was then cemented shut and remains so to this day. The other report was regarding a 12-year-old slave girl named Leah. Leah was brushing Delphine's hair and pulled just a little too hard. Delphine flew into a rage and whipped the girl. To escape further punishment, the girl climbed out and onto the roof where she leapt to her death. Delphine was witnessed burying Leah's corpse, and police were forced to fine her $300 and made her sell nine of her slaves. However, mistreatment of slaves by the wealthy and socially connected was not a matter for the police at the time, so they didn't flinch when she bought her nine slaves back. 
I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… Winnie had two trunks when she arrived at the train station, trunks that contained the severed body parts of her two best friends. She had murdered them, it seems, all in the name of love. Was British government weapons inspector Dr. David Kelly murdered? But first, Madame Delphine LaLaurie, made popular by Kathy Bates in American Horror Story Coven, was a first-class monster. A figure of high society, she was well known for her mistreatment of slaves. But no one knew just how sick she truly was. We'll begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Delphine LaLaurie was born Marie Delphine McCarty on March 19, 1787, in New Orleans, Louisiana, as one of five children in Louisiana's Spanish-occupied territory. Her father, Louis Bartholomew McCarthy, was an Irish immigrant, and her mother, Marie Jean, was a French woman. Louise shortened the family's surname to McCarty, and together they all immigrated to the United States in 1730. They lived in the White Creole community and engaged in many profitable ventures. One of Delphine's uncles, Esteban Rodriguez Miro, was a governor, and her cousin, Augustine de McCarty, became mayor of New Orleans from 1815 to 1820. Remaining family members were wealthy merchants, army officials, and slavers. Delphine was beautiful, and men were quite interested in her. When she hit the tender age of 13, it wasn't hard for her family to find her a suitable groom. She was married in June 1800 to a high-ranking Spanish official by the name of Don Ramon de López y Angelo. A major part of New Orleans was under Spanish occupation, so when Don was appointed Consul General of Spain, Delphine became one of the most powerful women in the state. In 1804, Don Ramon received a letter with a royal command stating that the young Spanish officer was to take his place at court as befitting his new position. Don Ramon and a very pregnant Delphine departed the United States and paused in Havana, Cuba. While there, Don Ramon became very ill and died just days before his daughter was born. She was named Marie Delphine Borja Lopez y Anjula de Candelaria, but became best known in her later years as Borquita, meaning Little Borgia, from the fact that she was named after her father's grandmother. Widowed and with a newborn baby, Delphine returned to New Orleans where she lived comfortably in her mansion. In 1808, she married a second time to one of the richest men in the region, who was also a well-settled merchant, banker, and lawyer. Jean Blanc bought them a house on Royal Street, which became known as Villa Blanc. He and Delphine had four children, Marie-Louise Pauline, Louise-Marie Laure, Marie-Louise Jean, and Jean-Pierre Pauline Blanc. Delphine remained a figure of high society, spending time with the other socialites. Her marriage to Jean Blanc did not last long, albeit longer than her marriage to Don Ramon. In 1816, 
Jean Blanc died after just eight years of marriage. She remained a widow for the next nine years, and that was when she met Dr. Leonard Louise Nicole Lalori. He had come to New Orleans from Villeneuve sur Lot, France, and was ready to set up a practice. Although he was much younger than Delphine by 20 years, the couple were married on June 12, 1825. As a busy doctor, Leonard was not at Delphine's side often. In 1831, Delphine purchased a three-story mansion at 1140 Royal Street in the French Quarter, complete with attached slave quarters. She lived there with Leonard and two of her daughters, as her other children had moved on and married, while maintaining her central position in New Orleans society. The LaLauries maintained several slaves in their attached quarters. While out in public, Delphine was often observed being generally polite to black people and even concerned for her slaves' health. She had even mamooted two of her slaves, Jean Louise in 1819 and Devines in 1832. However, other accounts of her treatment of slaves was not so kind. For example, British social theorist and Whig writer Harriet Martineau wrote in 1838 that she had witnessed Delphine's slaves to be singularly haggard and wretched. She also wrote that public rumors about Delphine's mistreatment of her slaves were so widespread that a local lawyer had to visit her home to remind her of the laws for the upkeep of slaves. However, during his visit he found no evidence of wrongdoing or mistreatment of slaves. Beyond the treatment of her slaves, Delphine was having marital problems. Neighbors reported hearing loud arguments and noises coming from the home. In 1834, the couple officially called it quits, and Leonard moved out of the house. It is said that after three tragic, failed marriages, Delphine went mad. Rumors spread about Delphine's slaves living in constant fear as she mistreated them a lot. One rumor claimed that she kept her 70-year-old cook chained to the stove, starving. Another claimed she kept secret slaves for her husband to practice Haitian voodoo medicine on. Two reports of mistreatment are on record as being true. One slave, terrified of punishment from Delphine, threw himself out of a third-story window, preferring death over torture. The third-story window was then cemented shut and remains so to this day. The other report was regarding a 12-year-old slave girl named Leah. Leah was brushing Delphine's hair and pulled just a little too hard. Delphine flew into a rage and whipped the girl. To escape further punishment, the girl climbed out and onto the roof where she leapt to her death. Delphine was witnessed burying Leah's corpse, and police were forced to fine her $300 and made her sell nine of her slaves. However, mistreatment of slaves by the wealthy and socially connected was not a matter for the police at the time, so they didn't flinch when she bought her nine slaves back. Then, on the afternoon of April 10, 1834, the LaLaurie Mansion went up in flames. When police and marshals barged into the house to get the fire under control, they found a 70-year-old slave woman chained to the stove, while Delphine frantically tried to save her valuables. The police set the woman loose, and she led them up to the attic, where it was believed that slaves would go and never return. There, they found seven slaves, tied with spiked iron collars. As the authorities were releasing the slaves, they discovered that their bodies were badly mutilated with their limbs deformed and in some cases their intestines had been pulled out of their bodies and tied to them. They also discovered discarded corpses and mutilated body parts. Other slaves were found chained in their quarters. Once the fire had been extinguished, the 70-year-old woman confessed to setting the fire because she was afraid of the punishment Delphine was going to give her. Those that had helped free the chained-up slaves were indignant, and on April 15th, a mob charged the LaLaurie Mansion and began to wreck it. They were only dispersed when a company of the United States Regulars, or the Regular Army, were called out by the helpless sheriff. 
During the chaos, Delphine and Leonard took off to their carriage and escaped the city with their Creole black coachman, Bastian, driving. It was written in 1838 by Harriet Martineau that they fled to a waterfront and boarded a schooner. They traveled to Mobile, Alabama, and then to Paris. While the LaLauries made their escape, a mob of nearly 4,000 townspeople ransacked their mansion, smashing windows and tearing down doors. The slaves were taken to a local police station, where they detailed the atrocities carried out on them. They told tales of Delphine performing medical experiments on them, including removing their skin, breaking bones and setting them into peculiar positions, amputating limbs. They were forced to wear spiked collars, spoke of an exposed brain being stirred with a stick, and of a friend having their lips sewn shut after Delphine placed animal feces in their mouth. The slaves were then presented for public viewing, which fueled the rage already burning within the townspeople. By the time it was over, the LaLaurie mansion was in ruins. Neither Delphine nor Leonard ever returned to New Orleans. She was respected and lived a good life in Paris until the day she died. Her death is somewhat of a mystery. However, with some claiming that she died during a boar hunting accident and others claiming she recently returned to New Orleans to live a secret life of anonymity. Looking through official documents, you'll find that Paris has recorded her death as December 7, 1849. Unsettling, however, is the old cracked copper plate found in the late 1930s in the New Orleans St. Louis Cemetery bearing the name LaLaurie Madame Delphine McCarty. The inscription, in French, claims that Madame LaLaurie died in Paris on December 7, 1842. To this day, the remains of Madame Delphine LaLaurie have never been found. Up next, Winnie had two trunks when she arrived at the train station, trunks that contained the severed body parts of her two best friends. She had murdered them, it seems, all in the name of love. That story and more when Weird Darkness returns. On October 18, 1931, Winnie Ruth Judd, an attractive 26-year-old secretary from Phoenix, Arizona, arrived by train in Los Angeles. She had some very strange baggage with her when she rolled into the station – trunks that contained the severed body parts of Winnie's two best friends. She had murdered them, supposedly in the name of love. The bizarre tale began in Arizona. Winnie along with her two friends, Agnes Ann Leroy, 32, and Sarah Hedvig Sammy Samuelson, 24, were all in love with the same man. His name was Jack Halloran, and he was a good-looking playboy who never let the fact he was married stand in the way of a good time. The whole affair was a mess. Not only were Ann and Sammy occasional lovers, but both of them were also seeing Jack. Winnie met Jack when she was working as a nanny for his next-door neighbor. Like Jack, Winnie was married, but her doctor husband was often away on business, so the pair began secretly seeing each other. Their affair began on Christmas Eve, 1930, and continued until that dark day in October 1931 when Winnie ended the lurid activities with murder. A lot of the case remains shrouded in mystery, which is largely due to Winnie's varying accounts and the baffling details of the murders. 
What is known is that Anne and Sammy were shot to death in Phoenix and that their bodies were discovered a few days later at the Los Angeles train station. They had been stuffed into steamer trunks. Sammy's body had been cut into pieces of various sizes and placed in different cases. It was the blood that was oozing out of the seams that alerted station agents that something was seriously amiss. Winnie immediately became the prime suspect, but police wondered how the petite woman had managed to kill, cut up, and pack up the bodies of two other women. Why would she do it? Did she have help? And why did she catch a train to L.A. and bring the grisly luggage with her? The commonly accepted version of events starts on Friday, October 17. Winnie was at home, fuming over her friend's affairs with Jack. She snapped that night, grabbed a knife and gun, and went over to Sammy and Anne's bungalow. When she arrived, she left her shoes and the knife outside the back door. She mustered up the courage and broke in. She first went to Anne's room and pulled the trigger from the doorway. When Sammy heard the shots, she rushed to the room. She jumped on Winnie and managed to take the gun from her. Winnie fled to the back door and retrieved the knife. She lunged at Sammy and stabbed her in the shoulder. The women struggled. Sammy shot Winnie in the left hand as Winnie fought her for the gun. She finally got it away from Sammy and shot her in the head. When the struggle ended, Winnie questioned what to do with the bodies. Anne's corpse fit into a large traveling trunk, but Sammy required a lot of work. Winnie had to cut her into pieces, and she stuffed her into a series of traveling bags. She managed to load all of it into her car and returned home. Then, on Sunday, October 18, she, along with the case that contained Anne and the three cases of Sammy, boarded the Golden State Limited train that was bound for Los Angeles. When the train arrived in L.A., the pungent stench and bloody trail left by Winnie's luggage got the attention of the station agent. He confiscated the bags and demanded that they be opened. Winnie claimed that she had no keys for the trunks and then fled the station. The agent called the police and detectives arrived to crack open the luggage and discovered the gruesome contents. A search immediately began for Winnie Ruth Judd. On October 23rd, she finally surrendered at a funeral home. The news of the ghastly murders spread quickly, and the story was splashed across the front pages of newspapers. The Phoenix bungalow became a morbid tourist attraction, and Winnie's case became a media sensation. Winnie's trial began on January 19, 1932. Winnie's unofficial version of events was that the murders were committed in self-defense and the other women had attacked her. Her lawyers, meanwhile, claimed she was insane. The prosecution maintained that it had all been premeditated, the work of a jealous woman. What Winnie actually thought during the trial remains unknown. She never took the stand in her own defense. Winnie never took the stand in her own defense and on February 8, 1932, the verdict came down. We'll tell you what happened when Weird Darkness returns. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? These are just some of the questions that I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marlar. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect here on the Weird Darkness show, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy along with your creepiness, check out Mind of Marlar on YouTube or just visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marlar. 
Coming up, was British government weapons inspector Dr. David Kelly murdered? We'll let you decide when I bring you the evidence for and against the theory in just a couple of minutes. But first, we return to the story of Winnie and her unofficial version of events was that the murders were committed in self-defense after the other women had attacked her. Her lawyers, meanwhile, claimed she was insane, and the prosecution maintained it had all been premeditated, the work of a jealous woman. So, what was her fate? She never took the stand in her own defense. On February 8, 1932, she was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death by hanging February 17, 1933. By this time, Winnie had managed to drum up a lot of sympathy and a lot of support. There were accusations of shoddy police work, belief that she was defending herself and, of course, her lawyers' continued assertions that she was mentally ill. Supporters, including Eleanor Roosevelt, petitioned the state of Arizona to reconsider the death penalty in her case. And then the story took another turn. In January 1933, a grand jury indicted Jack Halloran as an accomplice to the murders. Winnie became the star witness in the preliminary hearing that followed the indictment. She was still claiming self-defense, but added that Jack had helped her with the disposal of the bodies including Sammy's dismemberment. It had been Jack's idea, she said, that she would board a train with the bodies and travel to L.A., where another accomplice would get rid of them for good. Halloran never took the stand. His defense maintained that Winnie's testimony was that of a crazy person. Apparently, the judge agreed. The case was dismissed against Halloran that month. Meanwhile, Winnie was still set to hang. Then, just days before the execution, a panel declared her to be insane. She was spared the noose and sent to the Arizona State Insane Asylum. But with a story this bizarre, that's still not the end. Not long after Winnie arrived at the asylum, she escaped. And she escaped again. And again. A total of seven times. Her last escape was in 1962, and she stayed on the loose for seven years, living in Northern California under an assumed name, Marion Lane. The police finally caught up with her in 1969, but in 1971, Arizona Governor Jack Williams granted her a pardon. She returned to a quiet life as Marion Lane and passed away in her sleep in 1998 at the age of 93. And no, that's still not the end. In 2014, a confession letter that was written by Winnie to her lawyer in 1933 was found in a security box in the Arizona State Archives. The startling account, 19 pages in Winnie's cursive handwriting, reveals every sordid detail of the crime. Is the letter the rambling of a mentally ill woman or a cold-blooded killer? You can decide for yourself if you would like. I have a link to those handwritten pages of the letter in the show notes. In September 2002, British Prime Minister Tony Blair stood up in Parliament and declared that Iraq was a serious threat to the UK's national security and must be invaded. Waving a dossier of intelligence, Blair said Iraq was capable of striking British forces with weapons of mass destruction within 45 minutes. The intelligence later would be shown to be false, but on the basis of the dossier, the UK Parliament approved the invasion of Iraq in March 2003. In May 2003, journalist Andrew Gilligan reported on BBC Radio that he had learned from his sources that the Blair government had sexed up the dossier in order to exaggerate the threat Iraq posed. This caused a storm of controversy, and Blair's government fiercely attacked the BBC over the report. Gilligan's source was quickly revealed by the media as Ministry of Defense weapons expert Dr. David Kelly. Kelly was an expert in biological warfare and a former UN weapons inspector. He was sure the Blair government 
had exaggerated the intelligence about Iraq and told Gilligan in an off-the-record discussion. On June 15, Kelly was summoned to appear in front of a parliamentary committee where he was intensely questioned about his actions. 48 hours later, he was dead. Kelly, it seemed, had committed suicide. He had gone for a walk in the woodlands near his home, slid his wrists, and overdosed on painkillers. Kelly's death plunged the Blair government into a major crisis, and the next day they launched an official investigation, chaired by Lord Hutton, its remit to investigate the circumstances surrounding the death of Dr. Kelly. There was speculation that perhaps Kelly had been hounded to his death, even murdered, by some element of the government or intelligence services. Kelly's exposure of the government's lies over Iraq's weapons of mass destruction had cost him his life. Did the strain of being barraged in public by politicians and revealed as the source of Gilligan's story put an unbearable strain on him? Or had he been assassinated by some sinister forces within the government, seeking to silence him for exposing the lies that led to an illegal invasion of Iraq? Was Dr. Kelly murdered? On the morning of the 17th of July, Kelly sent his friend, American author Judith Miller, an email. In it, he complained ominously that there were many dark actors playing games. In other emails he sent at the same time, Kelly does not sound like a man about to end it all. He says how much he's looking forward to getting back to work and mentions his plans to travel to Iraq the next week. Kelly took a phone call mid-afternoon then left the house at about 3.20 p.m. Just before midnight, after not returning, his family reported him missing. Dozens of police, neighbors, and volunteers soon formed search parties and set out to find Kelly. There is, however, reason to believe he was already under surveillance before he went missing. The scientist had become the focus of a huge political and media storm, one with international repercussions. The day before, he was even interrogated by MI5 in a safe house. Kelly had already told friends he feared his body would be found in the woods and was reportedly working on a tell-all book about WMD. He was both a target and a potential security threat. He must surely have been subject to some as-yet-undisclosed surveillance operation. The police seemed to think so. That night, whilst the search parties looked for Kelly, they stripped the wallpaper in the house, presumably looking for bugs. It already seemed evident the police knew more than they had admitted. The official investigation into Kelly's death, Operation Mason, was opened before he was even reported missing. Meanwhile, the search continued. At 3 a.m., a police helicopter fitted with heat-seeking cameras flew over the very spot Kelly would be found just six hours later and didn't find him. How could Kelly not be there? The pathologist estimated he died somewhere around this time. How could the helicopter not pick up the warmth of his body? The heat-seeking cameras either failed to do their job or Kelly had died somewhere else and his body was moved. A further mystery surrounded reports of another helicopter landing at the Kelly's property, then leaving soon after. Freedom of information requests revealed only a heavily redacted set of names. Who was on board? Kelly's body was finally found around 9 a.m. in Woodland Clearing at Harrowdown Hill, a local beauty spot close to his home. His head and shoulders were slumped against a tree. Many doctors, paramedics, politicians, and journalists were troubled by the circumstances of Kelly's death and odd details at the crime scene. Louise Holmes, a search and rescue volunteer, discovered Kelly's body and along with her colleague Paul Chapman gave clear testimony about the crime scene. He was at the base of the tree, with almost his head and his shoulders just slumped back against the tree, Holmes told the Hutton Enquiry. This was consistent with her police statement. I saw that this person was slumped against the base of the tree with his head and shoulders resting against the trunk. On their way to alert police, Holmes and Chapman met Detective Constable Graham Coe. At Hutton, Coe was asked who he was with when he met the pair. 
For reasons never adequately explained, he lied. Coe told Hutton he was with one other man, Detective Constable Shields. In fact, the two were with an unidentified third man, a lie later admitted by Coe. Coe now claims the third man was a police trainee who he didn't want to name. Why would Coe risk being exposed as a liar at an official inquiry over something so innocuous? Coe's odd lie was particularly telling in light of what happened during the next hour, which I will reveal to you when Weird Darkness returns. Coe's odd lie was particularly telling in light of what had happened during the next hour. Somebody had moved Dr. Kelly's body. Coe claimed he stood and guarded the body until the arrival of police alerted by Holmes and Chapman. But by the time the other officers arrived, Kelly's body had changed position. P.C. Sawyer arrived first, accompanied by two paramedics. One of the paramedics, Dave Bartlett, described the scene. He was lying flat out some distance from the tree. He definitely wasn't leaning against it. Kelly was now so far away from the tree that Bartlett was even able to get in behind Kelly as he checked for signs of life. Who had moved Kelly's body? And why? The obvious implication is DCI Co. or the men he was with had altered the crime scene. Although caught out in one lie, Co.'s suspicious behavior has never been explained. The medical evidence surrounding Kelly's death proved to be highly controversial. The official verdict was that he had died due to a self-inflicted injury to the ulnar artery and an overdose of his wife's Propraxamol tablets. Many medical professionals disagreed. In a series of letters to the national press, a number of concerned doctors disputed the official verdict. They felt the injuries to Kelly could not cause his death. They pointed out people rarely die by wrist cutting. The arteries immediately began to close up and constrict the blood loss. Dr. Bill McQuillan, who had dealt with hundreds of wrist accidents, said, I've never seen one death of somebody from cutting an ulnar artery. The choice of the ulnar artery was particularly odd. The ulnar artery is deeper in the wrist and covered by nerves and tendons, which would require considerable force to cut. Why would Kelly choose that rather than the easy access radial artery? Nor could the painkillers have caused his death. The levels of the drug found in his stomach and bloodstream were much too low to have killed Kelly. Three empty blister packs were found on Kelly's body, but this was no proof of ingestion. The paramedics agreed with the doctors. David Bartlett and Vanessa Hunt, the first medical professionals to tend to Kelly, were so baffled as to the lack of blood at the scene they went to the press. I've seen more blood at a nosebleed than I saw there, Bartlett said in an interview. The arterial spray should have covered Kelly and the whole area with blood, but very little was found. There just wasn't a lot of blood. When somebody cuts an artery, whether accidentally or intentionally, the blood pumps everywhere, Hunt said. Dr. Bill McQuillan concurred. If Kelly has slit his ulnar artery, his closed face and any surrounding structures would show evidence of that with the blood scattered as from a watering can. Some blood was found at the scene, but it takes around three to four pints of blood loss for an adult male to die, a huge amount that should have been apparent to all present. According to police reports, various items were found at the scene. A small water bottle, a gardening knife, a painkiller blister pack, his glasses, and his watch no fingerprints were found on any of the objects. Whilst it is common to find no identifiable fingerprints on such evidence, to find no prints at all is unusual. No mention of this was made at Hutton. The water bottle found near Kelly's body was still half full. It's difficult to see how Kelly could have swallowed 29 Copraximol tablets, as alleged, with such little water. Worse still, 
Hutton failed to mention reports that Kelly suffered from unexplained dysphagia, a syndrome that makes it difficult for the subject to swallow pills. Hutton failed to cover another medical issue. Kelly had fractured his left elbow earlier that year and, according to friends, was unable to cut a steak with his right hand. Why then would Kelly choose to cut his wrists with his right hand? Kelly, an expert in the science of death, had chosen an unlikely suicide method. Kelly would have been well aware that wrist slitting was unlikely to kill him. It's normally associated with young people and a cry for help. Hutton also glossed over some disturbing details from the autopsy. Various scuffs, abrasions, and cuts were found, but they were blithely dismissed as being caused by Kelly stumbling. Could they have been evidence of a struggle with a third party? Acetone was found in Kelly's blood and urine, which may have indicated he died much later than thought, later than 1 a.m. If so, the obvious question is why Kelly would disappear then wait some eight hours or more to commit suicide. These problems with the suicide scenario, along with the improbability of it proving fatal, led to a campaign by a group of doctors to have an official inquest opened into Kelly's death. The Hutton inquiry was set up the day after Kelly's death, and it immediately shut down and superseded the coroner's inquest. Inquests are routinely opened in the case of violent, sudden, or suspicious deaths. They are legal bodies that have the power of subpoena and evidence is given under oath. In contrast, the Hutton inquiry had no legal authority, failed to call many key witnesses, and no evidence was given under oath. Amazingly, even the head of the police investigation into Kelly's death was not called to testify. This caused disquiet and concern even amongst those who believed Kelly did kill himself. Replacing an inquest with a political inquiry was unique in all British legal history. Hutton's subsequent report was widely regarded as a whitewash that was designed from the outset to declare Kelly's death nothing more than a tragic suicide. The suicide scenario was further reinforced in the media by several individuals claiming to have an insight into Kelly's mental state. The most prominent of these was Tom Mangold, a veteran journalist with links to the intelligence services. As soon as lunchtime on the day of Kelly's death, Mangold began an exhaustive series of TV and newspaper interviews. Always described as a close or long-time friend of Kelly's, the journalist repeatedly told the media how certain he was Kelly had committed suicide. As a personal friend, Mangold seemed to have an insight into Kelly's troubled mind. The scientist was apparently stressed, unhappy, and upset he had been publicly exposed. Mangold, a reputable mainstream journalist, had perhaps, more than anyone, helped to fix the idea that Kelly was in a suicidal state of mind. However, it soon became clear that Mangold was, at the very least, exaggerating his relationship with Kelly. At Hutton, it was revealed Mangold had actually known Kelly just five years and met him only a few times. Kelly was strictly a contact who he had talked to occasionally regarding stories he was working on. Why then did Mangold bombard the media with interviews claiming to be a close personal friend of Kelly? Why had he told us with such certainty Kelly was suicidal when he hardly knew him? Many of Kelly's own communications at this time including one where he rebuffs supposed friend Mangold, actually show him to be optimistic and looking forward to getting back to work. He was also a hardened UN weapons inspector, used to dealing with intense pressure and confrontation. The idea he was so troubled by the media attention that he killed himself seems very unlikely. Mangold's tireless attempts to portray Kelly as suicidal appeared to be a part of a larger media campaign to rubbish the idea that his death could have been murder. Numerous debunking articles and documentaries appeared which tried to shut down debate using misleading evidence and attributing false claims to the skeptics. MP Norman Baker, who wrote a book alleging Kelly was murdered, provoked some positive news coverage but was largely singled out for ridicule. In 2011, Attorney General Dominic Grieve refused the campaigning doctor's request for an inquest. Despite all the contrary evidence, Grieve told Parliament the evidence Kelly had committed suicide 
was overwhelmingly strong. Several commentators have cast doubt on the motive for killing Kelly. Most alternative accounts of Kelly murdered for his role in exposing the U.S. and U.K.'s government lies over Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. However, with the story already out, what could be gained from murdering him? His death only deepened a global controversy, attracting even more coverage and scrutiny to the false WMD claims. This is a compelling argument. Sanctioning the murder of Kelly would have been an insane act that could have only made the situation for the perpetrators worse. However, Bob Coe, in his film Anthrax Wars, proposes a more credible alternative motive. Kelly was heavily involved in classified biowarfare research at a top-secret facility at Porton Down. Cohen suggests Porton Down may have been involved with South Africa's Project Coast, a project designed to create a race weapon. Could worries that Kelly had been talking to journalists and may have been working on a tell-all book about biowarfare have led to his murder? If it became public that the U.S. and U.K. had been involved with illegal and unethical research into bioweapons that would target only black people, the consequences would be dire. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell someone about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can follow me on social media, drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I have already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Titus 2 verse 11 – For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And a final thought. Doubt is the enemy of the soul and the biggest threat to the humane. It should be taken with the greatest type of seriousness and eradicated without mercy. Vasile Montaneo I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Journalism can be a dangerous job, especially investigative journalism. History has documented numerous reporters who were kidnapped or murdered because of knowledge they may have possessed, and some theorists believe one of them is Dorothy Kilgallen, an American journalist and TV game show personality who died of an alleged drug overdose in 1965. Kilgallen was known for being a panelist on the TV show What's My Line?, along with The Voice of Broadway, a newspaper column she began writing in 1938. At its height, Kilgallen's column appeared in over 140 newspapers in the United States. Her articles mostly centered around celebrity gossip and show business, but one of her final research projects involved both politics and crime – the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. While investigating the case, Kilgallen passed leaving many to speculate whether there was more to her death. No one has ever proved anything other than what the autopsy claimed, but one modern lawyer and author, Mark Shaw, has taken it upon himself to investigate Dorothy's life and death. Was Dorothy Kilgallen slain, or was it merely a case of accidental overdose? Shaw claims there may have been foul play and something more sinister than an OD, and is committed to opening a broader investigation into the mysterious story. Kilgallen may have been the journalist who knew too much.
and paid the price for it. Kilgallen's last day alive was a typical one. She spent the day and most of the evening working on the panel of the CBS TV show What's My Line in New York. After filming, she went to the Regency Hotel bar for a drink before heading home. She returned to the apartment she shared with her husband, and he reported later she had been in good spirits. Kilgallen went to bed shortly after arriving home, but did not sleep in the same room as her husband. On the morning of November 8, 1965, 52-year-old Kilgallen was found dead by her hairdresser and a maid in her townhouse. She was sitting up in bed, still wearing makeup, false eyelashes, and a flower in her hair from the previous night. Autopsy results claimed Kilgallen died from a fatal combination of alcohol and prescription pills. Many assumed the autopsy results meant Kilgallen had a secret substance abuse problem which tainted her posthumous reputation. Others believed something else entirely may have happened. After all, Kilgallen was known to take an investigative approach to her journalism, and many posited her research could have ended her life. Legal analyst and author Mark Shaw published a book about Kilgallen's death in 2016, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much. Through the use of the Freedom of Information Act, Shaw obtained several previously unreleased documents, including lab results from Kilgallen's autopsy report. While the initial report stated Kilgallen had secanol in her system, a sleeping pill prescribed to her by a doctor, the lab report also claimed she had two additional barbiturates in her system, tuinol and nembutol. Another curious discovery Shaw made was a statement in the autopsy's lab reports regarding a powdery substance found on the glass beside Kilgallen's bed. Shaw believes the existence of the powder residue on the glass proves someone drugged Kilgallen's drink. Neither the discovery of additional drugs in her system nor the powdered substance near her drink conclusively proves Kilgallen was murdered, but for Shaw, the revelations certainly put her alleged OD in a new light. In addition to Kilgallen's complete autopsy paperwork, Mark Shaw obtained an FBI file on her which revealed she was under FBI surveillance at the time of her death. The notes in the file referenced Kilgallen's trip to Florida to interview Cuban exiles about their negative opinions on Fidel Castro, a controversial move at the time. Additionally, the FBI had notes covering Kilgallen's research on John F. Kennedy's death, as well as her reporting on the trial of Jack Ruby, the Texas nightclub owner who fatally shot Lee Harvey Oswald. In fact, Kilgallen published Ruby's court testimony before it was made public to anyone and that reportedly upset FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Kilgallen was perhaps the first known journalist to write about the alleged John F. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe affair. Her article published August 3, 1962, two days later, Monroe was found dead from an alleged OD. Following Monroe's death, Kilgallen began publicly questioning the autopsy report, believing there was more to the story. Coincidentally, Kilgallen passed three years later, in the same manner. One of the details of Monroe's death that Kilgallen questioned was the light left on in Monroe's bedroom. Kilgallen wrote, if she were just trying to get to sleep and took the overdose of the pills accidentally, why was the light on? Usually people sleep better in the dark. When Kilgallen's body was discovered in her townhome, the light was also on in her room. Throughout the late 40s, Kilgallen and singer Frank Sinatra appeared together in public photographs on several occasions. But in 1956, Kilgallen wrote a multi-part feature story titled The Real Frank Sinatra Story, which delved into Sinatra's private life with a long list of his many romances. Sinatra took the story very personally and began going out of his way to speak ill of Kilgallen publicly. He attacked her appearance referring to her as the chinless wonder and comparing her to a chipmunk. Sinatra even went so far as to send her a tombstone. Kilgallen believed Louisiana crime boss Carlos Marcello had something to do with the Kennedy assassination. In fact, right before her death, 
She mentioned to friends and colleagues that she had a trip planned to New Orleans to speak with an informant and had discovered Marcello was working with Oswald. If Kilgallen made the connection that Marcello was involved in Kennedy's death, she was not the only one. The House Select Committee on Assassinations went against the Warren Commission in 1979, reporting Oswald had not acted alone in the murder. Moreover, they expressed that Marcello had the motive, means, and opportunity to plan and execute a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. Investigative author Mark Shaw theorized that Kilgallen's research and intentions of writing a tell-all book terrified Marcello and gave him reason to have her killed. Shaw also believes Marcello probably burned Kilgallen's research file on Kennedy's death. One of the last people to allegedly see Kilgallen alive was Catherine Stone, a contestant on What's My Line. Stone was at the Regency Hotel bar after work. While there, Stone witnessed Kilgallen having a private conversation with a mystery man. Following his investigation decades after Kilgallen's death, Mark Shaw later claimed the mystery man was Ron Pataki, a journalist from Ohio who was friends with Kilgallen and alleged the two were possibly having an affair while Pataki leaked information about John F. Kennedy's assassination to Kilgallen. Shaw also thinks Pataki may ultimately have been responsible for Kilgallen's death, as Pataki wrote somewhat cryptic but arguably gloating poems about Kilgallen after her death. One of the poems, titled Never Trust a Stiff at a Typewriter, included the line, Somebody who's dead could tell no tales. In another poem, Vodka Roulette, there is a drawing of a bartender making drinks with Pataki's caption, Make one of them poison. When confronted with Shaw's theory, Pataki stated he never had an affair with Kilgallen and was not at the hotel bar the night before her death. Pataki also claimed he loved Kilgallen dearly. Kilgallen was a woman to be reckoned with during the 50s. She was a professional businesswoman juggling several successful careers, along with being a wife and mother. She was considered an A-list celebrity and was known for throwing lavish parties at her home with guests, including Jane Mansfield and Beatles member George Harrison. Kilgallen made the modern equivalent of millions of dollars annually and was well-respected in her line of work. Ernest Hemingway once referred to her as the greatest woman writer in the world. Because of her coverage of the infamous Dr. Sam Shepard murder trial, some claimed Kilgallen was solely responsible for getting Shepard's murder conviction overturned. She revealed the presiding judge had called her into his chambers, asking her for an autograph and telling her that Shepard was guilty as hell. Kilgallen had her own prestigious career, but she married a prominent man as well. Richard Dick Colmar worked as a radio personality, television and film actor, and Broadway producer. The couple married April 6, 1940, and eventually had three children. Colmar and Kilgallen even worked together on a radio show they ran from their home, Breakfast with Dorothy and Dick. Since Kilgallen was a person of many talents, an interviewer once asked her about her favorite career, to which she replied, my first love is the newspaper and always will be. Journalism may have run through her veins, considering her father, James Kilgallen, was a well-known reporter with a career spanning 75 years. James began working for Chicago newspapers at just 15 years old, before moving to New York to work for Hearst Headline Service. While Mark Shaw was writing his book about Kilgallen and gathering information which he feels points to foul play, he contacted numerous individuals, including the New York District Attorney's Office, the Attorney General, and the Governor of New York. Shaw had posted all of his correspondence online, hoping to garner attention and encourage an official investigation into Kilgallen's death. In addition to his research, autopsy analysis, book, and speaking engagements, Shaw is bringing rare attention to the case. In a 2016 interview, Shaw stated, murder is murder whether it happened five days or 50 years ago. Victims have rights, and Dorothy was denied hers because there was no investigation. Kilgallen's file pertaining to the John F. Kennedy assassination has never been found. 
Mark Shaw believes it was destroyed. Whoever decided to silence Dorothy, he said, I believe took that file and burned it. Amateur sleuth Gene Bryant has also done a fair amount of research into Kilgallen's death. He claims her body contained a high dosage of nicotine, as noted in her autopsy, but this is mysterious, he says, because she didn't smoke. We found out nicotine can be injected, which could have caused a heart attack. Bryant also claims it was six hours after Kilgallen's death before any detectives arrived, and Bryant says Detective Jack Doyle, who worked the case, didn't believe the overdose story. Others who have studied the issue agree that Kilgallen's death was too strange and, coincidentally, timed to be anything but intentional. When Weird Darkness returns, a former schoolhouse has accrued a sinister reputation as one of the most haunted, weirdest places in Japan. The gold rush brought many to North Carolina, but it also brought death and hauntings. And something bizarre and terrifying is living below the streets of London, and there are many theories as to what it might be. These stories are up next. in the cold northern reaches of Japan is the nation's second-largest island, Hokkaido. Known for its spectacular natural vistas and picturesque scenery, it is perhaps not a place one would at first associate in any way with haunted locales and ghouls and ghosts. Yet here, in the rural town of Bibai, nestled among the beautiful vistas and right up against the Lake Miyajima wetland, lies the creepy and enigmatic ruins of a former schoolhouse that has accrued a sinister reputation as one of the most haunted weirdest places in Japan. The building itself was apparently built back in 1906 and was designed in a distinctive round shape from which it earns its simple nickname, the Round Schoolhouse. From the 1940s up until the 1970s, it was used as an elementary school after which it was closed for unknown reasons and simply left there where it stood to fall into ruin. Rather creepily, the structure seems to have been left as is, with tables and desks still set up collecting dust in the crumbling structure, all lined up as if expecting students that will never come. This would have once been a place of children playing and laughing, yet now, the surrounding grounds have become a thick tangle of overgrown brush that hungrily surround the building, the playground buried in forest growth to poke forth like the skeleton of some half-buried prehistoric beast, and any road that led there was long ago devoured by the forest, making the only way to reach it on foot from the nearest road. Dark rumors and stories sprang up almost immediately after the closing of the school, beginning with locals claiming that the woods in the vicinity were haunted by bobbing, mysterious lights and half-glimpsed shadowy figures, and the night often pierced by disembodied screams as well as other less discernible anomalous noises. Additionally, there were rumors of several children who had gone out to play in these woods to never come back. It was not long before these phenomena and rumors were linked to the abandoned former schoolhouse, and things would get spookier still. Through the late 70s and 80s, the round schoolhouse became a popular place to go and try and see ghosts, and by all accounts, it was absolutely infested with them. Frightened trespassers to the site would come back with terrifying tales of encountering all manner of supernatural phenomena on the school grounds or within its dilapidated building, and it has steadily become increasingly well-known on into later years as an absolute hotspot for the paranormal. Paranormal investigators who have been there 
consistently put this location in top 10 lists of Japan's most haunted places, and there have been Japanese spirit mediums who have been so overwhelmed with negative spiritual energy here, they refuse to come back. Japanese videos on YouTube of macabre adventure seekers in the ruins have also become quite popular, whether they show anything paranormal or not, and the legend of the haunted round schoolhouse of Bibai has surged. Even above and beyond talk of hauntings, more sinister rumors tell of people going off to explore the ruins only to disappear without a trace, and stories abound of abandoned cars found on the nearby road, their occupants said to have gone off toward the schoolhouse to never return. Perhaps worse yet are those said to have come back completely stark raving insane, driven over the brink of madness by whatever it was they had seen in that forsaken place. Stories of the missing or of people going mad at the round schoolhouse are very persistent on Japanese paranormal sites, with comments of witnesses common. While much of the information on the round schoolhouse is rather ambiguous and murky as to its veracity, there have been a few accounts that I have tracked down that seem particularly interesting. By far, one of the oddest reports I've seen was a group of three curiosity seekers who one day in 1998 went off to the ruins to poke around and seem to have gotten way more than they bargained for somewhere in the bowels of that old, darkened building. It started innocently enough, when the group of friends decided to make a trip out to the place after hearing some of the many scary stories about it. They parked their car along the lonely road and began their trek through the forest and its tangle of trees toward the main building. Once there, the main witness claims they were almost immediately overcome by a clinging, unsettling cold and that they sensed they were being watched from the shadows by an unseen force that seemed to creep along, following them. This was followed by a series of escalating paranormal experiences, such as items being knocked over, doors slammed shut, and, most frightening of all, the startled shout of one of the friends when he was apparently aggressively shoved by some invisible entity. The longer they stayed, the more the intensity of these phenomena increased, until they got to the point where they had seen enough and made their way back outside. As they did, a black form allegedly congealed out of the shadows and followed them. The witness would say, "'That shadow stalked us all the way out of the building and into the woods. We couldn't see it much as it was hiding, but we knew it was there. We could catch glimpses of it, and it made us pick up our pace. As we got closer to the car, it became more visible, tangible, and more threatening. We finally got into the car, and that was when something very black, large, and heavy slammed into us. It was as if a black bear had hit the car, but then it was gone, without a trace, and we were alone in the forest again. An even weirder account seems to suggest that there is some sort of vortex or interdimensional doorway within the round schoolhouse. This apparently happened as recently as 2000, and again involves a couple of amateur paranormal investigators drawn to this location by all of the mysterious tales and creepy stories. Perhaps it was their mistake to come here in the evening hours, but whatever the reason, they certainly came across something rather outlandish in that building. Even as they made their way through the forest towards the schoolhouse, they purportedly heard strange sounds coming from the trees, such as what sounded like someone banging on a tree with a stick, the sounds of someone snapping twigs, and what one of the witnesses swore was the sound of giggling. Things didn't get any more normal when they reached their destination, and disembodied footsteps seemed to echo out all around them but it was when they reached one particular room where things would take off into the truly bizarre. Here, they came across a faintly glowing opening in the wall, which supposedly shimmered and rippled. The witnesses would say of what happened next, We stared at this glowing patch upon the wall for several moments, and that was when something seemed to come out of it. It looked like a hunched-over figure, but it was impossible to see the face. 
Then there were others, coming out two at a time, until they were looming all around us in that dank, confined space. My friend and I looked at each other and ran. He says he looked back and the glowing was gone, but those shapes, they were everywhere. Unsettling, to say the least. And it is not apparent what happened after that, but they apparently made it out in one piece. One has to wonder just what these people saw. Was this some sort of portal? Was it all an illusion? Who knows? It does seem to fit into the idea floated around that this is a site that harbors some sort of doorway through dimensions, and that all of this is not a haunting, but rather a bleeding over of another realm into our reality. Indeed, the Round Schoolhouse has never had any particular tragedy or violent incident, as far as anyone knows. So is this the result of something even stranger than ghosts? Or is this an urban legend, orbited by creepy pasta tales and spooky stories? If you're ever in the vicinity of Bibai, Hokkaido, maybe you can go check it out for yourself, if you dare. North Carolina was home to America's first gold rush. When John Reed discovered gold on his property in 1799, he didn't first realize what he had. Reed's son, Conrad, discovered a large yellow rock in the creek that ran through the Reed farm. The family used the unusual stone as a doorstop until 1802 when a jeweler from Fayetteville who was passing through recognized the rock as gold and paid Reed $3.50 for it, money which Reed used to buy coffee beans and a calico dress for his wife. Later, Reed discovered that the actual retail value of the rock had been over $3,500. Reed successfully recovered $1,000 of that when the jeweler returned to buy more rocks from him. Word of the discovery soon spread, and what had until then been a quiet corner of Cabarrus County was soon covered with prospectors from across the world. North Carolina would remain America's leading producer of gold until the discovery of the precious metal in California in 1848. Reed's farm became the center of this gold fever, with the mine expanding from surface panning to shafts dug deep beneath the earth in search of loads of ore. Labor was imported from all across the world, and expert miners from Cornwall in England were brought in to establish the operations. Apart from the expertise these men brought, the immigration was fueled in part by local labor being still heavily dependent upon slavery. There was a general fear that slaves would pocket the gold and quite sensibly use it to buy their freedom. The Reed Gold Mine expanded, helping the growth of the nearby city of Charlotte. For nearly 40 years, North Carolina supplied the U.S. Mint with a substantial portion of its gold, reaching a staggering, for the time, $11,000 in 1804 alone. But where there's gold, there's greed, and where there's greed, there's violence. One property near Reed's, where gold was also found, was owned by a man named McIntosh, remembered to legend as Skinflint McIntosh. McIntosh sought the services of an expert miner named Joe McGee, but McGee was concerned over the tight-fisted mine owner's lack of concern for miners' safety. McGee asked McIntosh if he took the job and died in the mine, would McIntosh pay his widow $1,000? McIntosh responded that he would pay her $2,000, and so McGee went to work for Skinflint. One night, Joe McGee failed to return home. His wife Jenny rounded up his friends and formed a search party. Joe's friends, all experienced miners, searched all of Skin Flint's mine but found nothing. When several weeks passed, and with her husband still missing, Jenny McGee approached McIntosh, demanding the promised payment of $2,000. Skin Flint told the woman that her husband had run off on her and slammed the door in the woman's face. Soon after, McGee's friend Sean heard a knocking on his cabin door late one night. When he opened the door, he was startled to see a ghastly apparition, a specter that spoke to him in the voice of Joe McGee. 
the ghost told him that McIntosh had cut costs on building the mine and had used unsafe green timbers to secure the shaft. McGee's specter told Sean exactly where to look in the mine where the timbers had given way and he had died in the cave-in. And then the ghost asked if McIntosh had paid Jenny the money. When Sean said no, the ghost wailed and said, I'll haunt that mine of his forever, and disappeared into the night. The next day, Sean led a party back into the mine and uncovered Joe's body, just where the ghost told him it would be. Sean and his friends formed a well-armed delegation and confronted McIntosh, who confessed he had known of Joe's death and concealed it from the miner's widow. McIntosh paid Jenny the promised $2,000. After this, McIntosh could not find anyone willing to work for him. Some say it was because of his disregard for the workers' safety. Others say it was because of the terrifying white figure that would appear wailing deep in the mine. Skinflint McIntosh died a poor man, and some say that the ghost of Skinflint's mine can still be seen to this day. The UK's famous London Underground serves commuters traveling through Greater London as well as select parts of Buckinghamshire, Hertfordshire, and Essex. It can also claim the title of the world's oldest underground system of its type, given that it opened up for business on January 10, 1863. It is the longest, as well as certainly the oldest, subsurface railway system on the planet. Moreover, in 2007, one billion passengers were recorded as having used the underground since 1863. According to a number of select souls, however, the London Underground has played host to far more than mere tracks, trains, and a near-endless number of travelers. Deep within the winding tunnels of this subsurface labyrinth, bizarre and terrible things, many of a wild man variety, are rumored to seethe and fester and possibly even feed, too. And British authorities are doing all they can to keep the lid on the chaos and carnage that threatens to spread deep below the streets of the nation's historic capital city. We're talking about conspiracies of the underground type. Stories of strange creatures, many of a definitely cryptozoological nature, lurking in the London underground have circulated for years, and chiefly in fictional on-screen format. Such examples include the 1967 production of Quartermass and the Pit, in which bizarre, mutated, and diminutive ape-men who are the subject of advanced genetic experiments undertaken millions of years earlier by visiting Martians appear in the London underground of the 1960s in the form of spectral, manifested, inherited memories. The Web of Fear, a Doctor Who adventure that surfaced in the following year, 1968, that sees the Doctor and his comrades doing battle with robotic yetis on the underground. An American Werewolf in London, a 1981 film in which the Beast of the Tidal feasts on a doomed late-night rail traveler, and Reign of Fire, a 2002 production starring Christian Bale and Matthew McConaughey that involves around literal fire-breathing dragons burst forth from the old tunnels of the underground and decimate Britain and, eventually, the rest of the planet, too. Some of the older tales of creature-like entities prowling the tunnels under London were incorporated into a less well-known fictionalized movie, its name Death Line. Made in 1972, it starred horror film stalwarts Christopher Lee and Donald Pleasance. Then there is the matter of a man named Colin Campbell. Campbell maintains that while traveling home on the London Underground in the mid-1960s, he had a nightmarish encounter with a very strange beast. According to Campbell, it was late at night, and rather surprisingly, he was the only person to get off the train at its scheduled stop on the Northern Line. As the train pulled away from the unusually deserted and deathly and eerily silent platform, and as Campbell made his way towards the exit, he claims to have heard a strange growl coming from behind him. He quickly spun around and was shocked to see a large, 
hairy, ape-like animal lumbering across the platform toward the track, and seemingly mumbling to itself and no one else as it did so. Most bizarre of all, however, the beast was definitively spectral rather than flesh and blood. Around three-quarters of its body were above the platform, while its legs were curiously near-transparent and incredibly passed right through the platform. Campbell further asserts that, as he stood in awe, too shocked to even try to move, the beast continued to walk through the concrete, right onto the tracks, and then straight through the wall directly behind the tunnel, all the time paying absolutely no attention to Campbell in the slightest. Are savage, devolved humans really living, in literal cannibalistic style, deep under London? And are the old tunnels actually home to ghostly ape-men of the type encountered by Colin Campbell back in the 1960s? I'm inclined to suspect that Campbell's saga was his idea of a joke. After all, he does admit to being a fan of the BBC show Doctor Who. Enough said? Probably. The Yeti angle is, for me, a clincher. Those who are excited by tales of strange creatures roaming around deep below London, however, might suggest otherwise. Oh.